back to the Grox Science Show. Well, the belief in a higher power or supernatural entity or some form of a godlike being permeates all of human civilization. Why is there such a strong inclination to believe in God? Does the answer lie in our biology and our evolutionary past? Well, joining us today to discuss this issue is Dr. Jesse Baring. Dr. Baring is director of the Institute of Cognition and Culture at Queen's University, Belfast. He writes the popular weekly column, Baring in Mind, for the Scientific American website. He's the author of numerous scientific works on the subject, and he's penned the new release, The Belief Instinct, The Psychology of Souls, Destiny, and the Meaning of Life. And he joins us today to discuss this very fascinating topic. Uh, Dr. Baring, thank you very much for joining us today on the Grok Science Show. Hi, thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you on the program, and this is really a fascinating book that you've written here called The Belief Instinct, in which you talk about why there might be a biological basis for our belief in God. Why do you think that there's this persistent belief in God throughout human civilization? Well, the, I mean, the central argument that I'm making in the book is that belief in God is an artifact of our evolved social cognition, that our ability to think about the unobservable psychological states of other people was so adaptive in terms of explaining and predicting behavior that it has seeped into all sorts of categories in the natural world where it doesn't properly belong. And that includes, includes reasoning about inanimate objects. But also, the focus of this book is that it, it also has seeped into our reasoning about basically why bad things happen to good people, for example, or what is the purpose of my life. I have to, to answer that question, I'd have to basically conceptualize some author that had preconceived some design for my life to begin with. So I think that it's, a, it's an artifact that became adaptive over evolutionary time. So basically there's a desire to see intentionality in, in things which really have no active force behind it. That's correct. It's a, uh, I mean, the line that I take is a, a quite a strong one in, in, in an atheistic sense, that this is a cognitive illusion. But it's a cognitive illusion, I've argued, that actually had some adaptive significance because it gave us the impression that we're in a social relationship with a, a grand mind, essentially that is concerned about our moral behaviors, and that inhibited antisocial behaviors or transgressions and promoted pro-social behaviors. And one of the key features of our psychology is the so-called theory of mind. I'm wondering if you can explain that and how this leads to this sort of belief. So theory of mind basically is a, it sounds more complicated than it actually is. It's simply taking a theoretical perspective about somebody's uh, underlying mental states. So uh, I'm not in the studio with you right now, but I'm assuming that you're moving about in different ways and your, your face is contorting, your mouth is moving. Literally, that's all I could see. I could see your objective uh, behavior. But because I have a theory of mind, I can put myself into your shoes. I can reason about why you're doing what you're doing by using this theory of mind. I think the best example of how theory of mind comes into play is when people do things that are completely unexpected. So, you know, if we're walking down the street... We ask somebody what time it is, and he punches us in the face. You know, that's completely unexpected. He's probably got something, some psychological disorder, but we're going to actively psychoanalyze the causes for his actions when, because he's violated our expectations. Something very similar happens, I believe, when we're reasoning about misfortune. It's these sort of, you know, horrible traumatic experiences in our lives. So being diagnosed with cancer, getting divorced, or losing our finances, all of these types of things basically surprise us. And those are the types of events that have us asking why. We might immediately reject that as being, you know, an illusion, but we still experience that sort of visceral sense that this is not the way that it's supposed to be. So the book at its core is, is exploring the underlying psychology involved with these big, grand sort of existential questions rather than trying to explain the evolution of religious organizations proper. This is sort of the phenomenon of theory of mind then unique to humans. I mean, the evidence strongly suggests at this point that theory of mind is a human cognitive specialization. Now, whether chimpanzees, for example, or bonobos or scrub jays or dogs have some degree of theory of mind, I think that's still very much an open question. But there's absolutely no question that we are uniquely good at it in the entire animal kingdom. We are natural psychologists, as uh, Nicholas Humphrey said. It's this constant put yourself in the other person's shoe that leads to this being external force in nature? Yes, and I think if you look at something like you know the movement of natural theology, where they're basically trying to understand the natural world by getting into God's mind, it might strike us as nonsense, and I, in fact, think that it is nonsense, but it's simply our theory of mind misplaced. It's spilling over into ontological categories where it doesn't really belong. But it also happens when we're reasoning about why things happen to us as individuals, and I think that that's really where the seductiveness comes from in thinking about God. And you mentioned earlier that uh, this adaptation is, actually has evolutionary advantages. What might those be? So 
there are numerous studies now. I mean, this is, a, this is a, an early, early emerging field, but it's uh, you know it's, it's basically known as the cognitive science of religion. And some studies coming out now suggest that, for example, when you get people thinking about God, it makes them extremely self-aware and self-conscious, and it also makes them more generous in economic games. It contributes to them inhibiting some prepotent cheating response. So when I was a psychologist at the University of Arkansas, I put students in a lab, and half of the students were basically told this sort of fictitious story in passing that there was a ghost in the room. And then we left them alone in a highly tempting cheating task where they could win $50. And those students who were under the impression, or were told at least, that there was a ghost in the room uh, were significantly less likely to cheat. So it's not just God. I mean, it's supernatural agents, and I'm using God sort of in a, uh, a very generic sense here. But um, it's some observing mind that is concerned about our moral behaviors. And we've replicated those studies with children recently in a laboratory, one of my laboratories in Belfast. Children who were told that there was an invisible woman in the room with them, uh, when they were left alone, you know, we had the hidden cameras on them, they were much less likely to cheat at a game compared to, their, compared to the control group. So is this view that there's some force watching us leads to moral behaviors? <laughs> That's the argument. Now, the argument would essentially translate to you know, sort of genetic fitness terms in the sense that by preventing us from doing things that would harm our reputations and be discovered by other people, which is really the only punishment that would really exist, it would have been you know, a strong target of natural selection because it had protected our own reputations. Now, we don't have to be in the grips of this illusion that God's watching us to be good people, of course. And I think that, um, you know, one of the points that I try to make in this book is that technological innovations now have largely replaced God, because now we've got hidden cameras everywhere, we've got DNA analyses, lie detector tests, all these types of things that are behavior-regulating devices, very much like what God would have done in the ancestral past, or supernatural agents. Again, I'm, again, I'm using God in a very loose sort of generic sense. And it would, yeah, it would be especially dangerous when we underestimate, and if you think about our ancestors living in a fairly small scale society of, you know, 60 to 80 individuals, um, where there's not a lot of opportunities to really to migrate to external uh, other groups, you know, your reputation would be extremely important. You're sort of living in a scarlet letter, letter savanna, I say. And if you underestimate the risk of social detection and um, you try to engage in some sort of selfish task or selfish behavior, because you think you can get away with it. There's always the possibility, and probably a fairly good possibility, that uh, somebody is going to be watching you or somebody is going to find out. And uh, the difference between human beings and other species is that we have gossip. So it doesn't matter that uh, if, I, if we were two chimpanzees, for example, and I were to uh, attack you, <laughs> you know, you might attack me back, you might scream, whatever. But the fact that we have language means that you can tell somebody else that wasn't there, this absent third party who could tell somebody else, who could tell somebody else. So punishment could come weeks, months, years later, but ultimately it would hobble our reproductive success. It seems to me as if a lot of this is also dependent on the notion of, of self or, or self-awareness, that without that, this kind of view of there being other than the self couldn't exist. I think it's a big part of it. I think that you know one of the hallmarks of theory of mind, one of the consequences of the evolution of theory of mind would be that we would have developed a sense of shame, uh, because to experience shame, this sort of inhibiting sense that somebody else is watching us and evaluating us, we have to be able to take their perspective in looking at us. And if we didn't have that very powerful, potent uh, social emotion to help us control our behavior, and, you know, as you say, a sense, a deep-seated sense of self, then the mechanism probably wouldn't work. So, of course, there are a number of other researchers looking at related issues such as the evolution of morality and, and altruistic behaviors. Do you think that this intersects also then with the, the evolution of the presence or theory that there is a God? Yeah, absolutely. I, think, I mean, I think it's complementary to it. And the position that I'm taking in this book is that atheism is a cognitively unnatural state. It doesn't mean that we can't be atheists because we can reject the sense, we can reject the intuitions that we experience. But it's cognitively effortful. It rests on at least a basic understanding of scientific principles that would not have been present 100,000, 200,000 years ago, let alone most areas of the world today. So if you take religion out of it, if you take the idea of some moralistic supernatural agent out of the picture, it, it fails to characterize human sociality. So we, I, I think it's a big part of the puzzle. I don't think it's the only part of the puzzle of human morality, but it's a big part of it. Other noted atheist, Richard Dawkins, of course, being probably the most vocal of them, has argued that uh, religion has a great deal of harm in the world. 
I right, and I, I, I suppose you know I, I'm I'm taking a, a fairly I'm not a so I'm not you know this is not a polemic this book, and I'm not taking a sociopolitical stance about whether religion is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just trying to understand what exactly the, the cognitive foundations are. And I'm not entirely convinced that, you know, eradicating the world of religious belief would necessarily be the best thing for our species. I think it's a it's an individualistic case, and I think that, there you know, there's certainly loads of evidence in psychology studies showing that belief actually has substantial psychological, subjective well-being benefits. So I'm not motivated to, to sort of cleanse the world of religion, and I don't think it's possible because I think that, um, for the most part, our cognitive systems have evolved in such a way that we perceive the natural world in a supernatural sense, a very deep-seated supernatural sense, and we can't really change the nature of our cognition. This is the way that our brains simply work. It's kind of like you know an optical illusion. So I can be fully aware of the nature of the mueller liar test, for example, or you know the, the two lines, one looks longer than the other, but in fact we know that they're the same length. I can know as a fact that that's an optical illusion, but I still experience the illusion. I still experience one line being uh, longer than the other. And I think the same thing is quite true when we're thinking about you know, our own purpose in life and the afterlife. We, we still have the psychological experience, but we can reject that as being true outside of the head. So then what benefit do you think that there is then for realizing that a belief in God is just an illusion of, of the working of the mind? Well, I think it's it's just simply a better understanding of human human nature and human existence, and it brings clarity. And I think that that itself is a worthwhile endeavor. I, I think that the only time that we really sort of think about these things critically and clearly is when we, in conversations like this, I think in our day-to-day lives, it doesn't really pervade into the way that we interact with other people, for example, or the way that we conceptualize ourselves. But I can't see it any other way at this point. It is what it is, and I think that how, how people handle that information or handle the, the empirical knowledge that we're gathering now is going to differ from person to person. Some, some people might not be able to, to recognize it as an illusion. It might be such a powerful illusion that they don't even, you know, it, it works so well in their case that they can't see it any other way. Do you think then this could inform the discourse between you know, those of religious bent and those who are, who are not so much in terms of an understanding and they communicate with Yeah, them? I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, one of the big mysteries right now in, in the field, especially in developmental psychology, is the developmental sequence that leads to adult atheism. Very few children, you know, come into the world, you know, with a very sort of materialistic stance or, or you know, rejecting the religious ideas that they're being taught. So they're they're very. I, I would venture, I guess, to say that you know there are, there are no inborn atheists. That this is something that happens developmentally. But we don't know exactly what the factors are that make one one person become an atheist and, and the other not. But I, I do think it's going to help the discourse. I mean, I'm not sure that there's. I, I'm not sure that this is a way to sort of reconcile science and religion because I see that as a false dichotomy to begin with. It's all science, and you know, having a better understanding of the of the science of religion, I think, is the only way forward. There is a, a great deal of communal benefit uh, that people have found in terms of religious gatherings. And- you know, there's lots of interesting research on how religious ideology and religious beliefs influence one's group membership, for example. A colleague of mine, Richard Sosas at the University of Connecticut, has shown that when people engage in these high investment rituals, uh, such as Jews at the Wailing Wall, or spending six hours a day or something in prayer, this is basically a signal to others that they really do genuinely believe that they're going to be judged and evaluated by a supernatural agent. And you can trust that person. That person is not lying in terms of their beliefs. And, you know, personally, I, I found myself on occasion, actually, I mean, if, if somebody were to pose to me the question, who, would, who do I trust more, you know, all things considered, an atheist or, or a believer, I don't know. I mean, I might actually go with the believer. I mean, if you, if you think about, like, a taxi driver and the, and the taxi driver having a crucifix or a Bible, you know, on the, on the console in the car versus one that didn't, I might go with the believer, even though I'm an atheist, because I know that that person thinks that they could be punished if they cheat me. So, you know, these sort of signals that indicate one's belief could translate to, you know, some pretty significant social behaviors. Of course, one of the primary motivating factors for belief in God is the notion of an afterlife and the fact that uh, a belief in God would lead to the afterlife. 
Right. So, I mean, I mean, that's one of the really interesting things is how the afterlife and belief in gods go together so naturally. And it's not entirely clear. It's not immediately clear why that would be the case, um, not from a psychological perspective anyway. The work that I've done on people's afterlife beliefs, and my, you know, some of the earliest work that I did was with children's reasoning about the state of the mind after death. So we did a, a puppet show, basically, where a mouse puppet was killed and eaten by an alligator puppet. And then we asked the children a series of questions about the psychological functioning of the dead mouse. You know, could it still taste the grass that it ate right before it was eaten and killed? Was it still thinking about its mother? Was it, was it angry at its brother? And all these types of things. And the, the interesting findings to emerge from, from those developmental studies was that the youngest, the younger the child, you know, three- and four-year-olds, the more likely they were to say that the, the mind survived biological death. The older that children got, the more materialistic they got, presumably because of the, the inclusion of biologic, a biological understanding about the nature of the body. But what that suggested to us was that the sense that there's a psychological continuity after biological death is, some, is the default stance, and materialism comes later with scientific knowledge, which goes against the grain if you think about the sort of common sense assumption that children learn about the afterlife because they're taught that by you know, their parents or through culture and so on. Because, you know, presumably the longer they're in society, the more exposure they would have to these types of concepts. This isn't to say that children at that age, you know, three- and four-year-olds, believe in the afterlife, because that's, you know, the sort of propositional content of the belief is something that they're going to acquire through culture. But instead, they're sort of just set up psychologically to think that the mind survives death. So I've never been entirely convinced by the, the, the wish fulfillment theory, the sort of Freudian sense that we believe in the afterlife because we're simply afraid of an existence. I, I do think that fear of mortality is a big part of it, but I also think that it rests soundly on our inability to really conceptualize the afterlife as, as a sort of non-existent psychological state. So related but not completely intertwined with this notion of God. I think it comes together for most people in the sense that somehow they're going to meet God or whatever culturally manifested supernatural agent is in that society after they die.